So um, I'm Julia Cumberlidge and I was asked to chair the review. Uh, when you chair a review, the most important thing is to get the best people around you. And so on my left is Sir Cyril Chantler, who is the vice chairman of the review. And on my right is um, Simon Whale, who is also a member of this three panel, person panel. But next to Simon is Dr. Valerie Brass, and she is our secretary. And then next to um, Sir Cyril Chantler, um, who is our researcher, is Dr. Sonia McClark. Yeah. So that's us. We've got other people in the room, but they're here just to help us run the event. Um, so I think it'd be very useful if you could just say a bit about yourself. Is there any sort of statement <coughs> you yes, would like to um, make? Just to just clarify, for I'm currently a consultant with Access of Emergency in Dorchester because um, in 2006, because of um, a back problem, I, I retired from obstetrics and gynaecology because, because I was a consultant actually in Eastbourne and East Sussex. <coughs> but um, nevertheless, I, I do have quite an interest in uh, emergency obstetrics and gynaecology because many years ago I used to work in a thing called the obstetric flying squad that don't actually exist now, but it was one of the first models of pre-hospital care. So that, that's my background. Um, and oh, perhaps I should just first declare my interests. Uh, well, we've got a, a record of them, but if you right, yes. need to, please do, if you would like to, yes. so that we have it on the record. Okay. Because I should have said that we are videoing um, this oral evidence for everybody who comes to us. And right. then it's put onto our website right. uh, so that people can see <coughs> how we're okay. operating and how the sort of advice we're being given by others. Okay. <coughs> it's just that uh, two years ago I was asked to act as an advisor to the all-party parliamentary group on MESH. So right. I have actually been to some of their meetings and participated in some of their discussions. Right. And that's an unremunerated position. Um, also, I've actually given advice to many two of the campaign groups. One was called Messed Up MESH, which uh, I think started about eight years ago. And then the more recent one, Sling the MESH. Um, otherwise, I don't have any contacts with any of the organisations. Uh, part of the fact, of course, I'm still a fellow of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. Um, my interest in this is really because um, I, about, um, it was eight years, I was um, a member of the NICE Women and Children's uh, Guideline Review Panel. And you know, their role is not to produce guidelines, um, but it's to check the guidelines when they've been produced to make sure that they address the issues of the stakeholders and um, also the issues raised in that particular guideline. And I was the gynaecology representative for NICE and um, my colleague Christine Oppenheimer in Leicester was the obstetric representative for the Women and Children's Group. Um, and during that time, among other, it was a time when things were changing because we were asked to give informal advice to CERNIP, the previous safety efficacy registry of new interventional procedures. And then, I think by 2002, that had merged with NICE as the new interventional procedures. And again, the guideline review panel was just asked to give advice um, on guidelines. And there are some particular guidelines which are quite relevant to the um, domestic situation. Um, I have an interest in um, clinical safety and in medical law. Um, I, I, have a, I have a law degree, so I have a bit of a legal background. And um, also, I, my first degree um, at Cambridge was um, in chemical engineering. So I've always been interested in uh, plastics and other things. And I'm still a member of the Institute of Chemical Engineers because there's a lot of biomedical science which is yes. related to chemical engineering and medicine. So it, it's an interest of mine. And, um, well, we became aware of um, the discussions about MESH way back in. Just to correct one thing in the submission I made, there was a mistake. Um, on the first page I put, in 1997, I strongly opposed the decision of Senate to give TVT, the Transvaginal Taper, grade A rating, because of a limited co cohort studies and lack of long-term data. In fact, that was in 2000, because um, I hadn't got, it was quite difficult to get a hold of all the CERNIP records and um, afterwards I realised <coughs> that that was in 2000 because what CERNIP did actually in the year 1997, they gave um, sister urethra pexin, which is essentially the same operation, um, they gave it a C rating and then 
that was repeated in the next two years. And then in 2000, after there was some lobby to uh, change the rating. And uh, so Stanley had a separate little inquiry and then they deemed that um, it should be given an A rating. Um, Stanley have actually made it quite clear that they, they, don't, they didn't approve products. They basically gave advice. So they, they didn't see their role as um, approval. Although they did say originally when um, when they set up that they would actually hold registers of procedures, but they never really did that because they were actually quite a small group and they were underfunded and they, they had committee meetings, but it didn't really go any further than that. So there was talk of having registers of different procedures, but it didn't happen. And then over the years, um, I've just become sort of aware of the... Um, well, the developments in the mesh story and uh, what has happened. I must say, one of the things which perplexes me, um, I like to think I'm fairly neutral, but obviously there's been a lot of campaign groups. There's also been this inquiry because there seems to be a problem with mesh. Now, on the other side, um, some of the specialist societies and some articles and also some of the manufacturers, perhaps not surprisingly, have used terms that mesh is a gold standard um, and that it's a quick fix and it's a miracle cure. Now, I can't quite understand why there should be such a dichotomy of views um, and it's taken 20 years to find that out. Um, that's why I thought one of the, the main things perhaps the inquiry should do is think about a national recall similar to the, the hip recall which is actually under the auspices of the MHRA, isn't it? And that the patients are followed up every six months or a year or two years as appropriate. But that's not really happened with MESH, at least not from the MHRA, even though the special societies have actually set up um, audit processes. But I'm perplexed because of this dichotomy of views, because it's so important. If a, if a patient, if a woman actually is being considered for one of these procedures, obviously she needs to be given correct objective information about the immediate outcome and long term outcome and about the risks and benefits and the pros and cons about alternative procedures and of course about the option of actually not having surgery and using other, other things like facing therapy or just leaving as you are. So I find that strange and I'm sure the inquiry has been looking at that, why there's such a difference. Um, and then in latter years, of course, since 2009, um, just actually now 10 years ago, there have been campaign groups campaigning about MESH. And as you know, there have been many reports and activities from Scotland and Australia. And of course, there's a new one in France, ANSEM, which is the French equivalent of MHR, is currently conducting another inquiry into um, MESH outcome. Um, perhaps I should stop there. Right. Well, thank you. That's really very, very helpful. I'm sure there's bits of that which we would like to explore. Um, and I would like to go back a bit to um, CERNIP and the issue about the reclassification right. from um, C to A. And there was a very interesting um, article published in the BMJ in October, 10th of October last year. And um, in it, they, uh, uh, the um, journalist, um, who uh, is uh, Jonathan oh, Gordon, yes, yes, I've, I've yes you, you know it. Well, I think what comes out very clearly there is that there were a number of people, including David Richmond, who of course later on became the president of the Royal College of yes, Otsungani, yes who was very concerned about the way the reclassification was made. And also, um, there was Paul Hilton, who was another um, obstetrician gynecologist, yes. uh, and he said he couldn't really understand the way that the different classification was made when there was no evidence that anybody could actually, um, well, really look at in great detail to see why that had happened, how it had happened, what were the influences that actually made that happen. So I just wonder, thinking about that, and as I understand it, CERNIP was actually a sort of voluntary organization set up by the Royal Colleges. Um, but um, 
the Department of Health were advised actually to make it mandatory that people would have to respond to it and put in their evidence and everything and actually that was rejected. So just thinking back to that, could you say a little bit about your view of why the reclassification of MESH was made and also what impact that had on, on the current issues that we're dealing with today? <coughs> Yes, um, I was not a member of CERNET. Um It was just that there was some contact between the Nice Women and Children's um, Guideline Review Panel and CERNET because we realised we were doing similar things. Um, and so we did sort of meet up in a couple of basically informal meetings that when Nice were based in Holborn. Um, the reclassifications, they know, CERNET made it fairly clear, I think, that they, they were not a body who approved procedures. They just gave classifications, if you like, they gave advice based on evidence. And um, in 1997, when they gave the C classification, that was um, only to be used uh, as part of research trials, and there also to be a register of the outcomes. Um, and that, that was the case. And then it was, I think, by 2000 that uh, there was a lot of lobbying, so I understand. I wasn't there when I wasn't involved in that at all, but I asked them to, um, asked CERNIP to look at the classification because they felt it was affecting their sales in Sweden and France in particular. And it's just that time, Sweden was, um, well I think you know some of the background of the, how the procedure, the TBT was um, invented in Sweden and what's been discussed about the various interests there. And I think at that time France didn't have a very robust uh, system for checking medical devices because the, the precursor of ANSAP, which is the current French body, um, was called AFSAPS, and that was, I think, started after the CERNIP did the approval. Anyway, the reclassification, so there was a review, which I think you probably got a copy of, at least there's a, um, a letter from uh, NICE about the CERNIP review in Tomash, and apparently there was um, some uh, extensive discussions maybe even some differences of opinion about what they should do. Uh, I, I can read it out to you in a minute. Thing. And interestingly, they, they jumped from a, a C classification to an A classification, because if they if they had gone to a B classification, the B classification is um, effic efficacy approved, that the procedure works, but there may still be questions about safety. And again, with a B classification, um, there would be a register of all procedures. But for some reason it jumped right to an A procedure which was safe to use in clinical practice with no rider about registration of procedures and no rider about so concerns about safety. And that was a big jump. I don't think they'd done it for any other procedure mm -hmm. to go from C to A. So, and, um, so and I know they, they did um, discuss it in some detail. Uh, the actual words they used. And the, the, the wording was a bit strange. I mean, I didn't see this until afterwards, but it was the Senate review of January 2000. Um, I think you probably have been given that by the people. I think we need to check that actually on our database. It, it's the Senate review, January 2000, the tension of free urethropexy, tension of free vaginal <coughs> TBT. And it says, this is a relatively new, minimally invasive method of treating genuine stress incontinence of urine by sutilous insertion of proline mesh under the proximal urethra. CERNIP classes as a category C in October 1999, when in fact they had classed it as a procedure C back in 1997. Um, and the interesting thing is the third paragraph. It said, um, the manufacturers of TVT have submitted further reports of CERNIP to reconsider its grading. These included four papers, this is, the, this, is, this is the interesting thing, which had not already been reviewed, but two of these were duplicate publications in whole or part, and two were excluded for other reasons. There were also 30 conference abstracts, most of which consisted of incomplete or uninterpretable results. Five reports included patients undergoing concomitant vaginal surgery, and the results of, in inverted commas, pure TBT treatment was impossible to deduce. Those with only subjective outcome, 
or follow up less than six months were also excluded. This left six reports, all conference abstracts, of 268 patients with an 86% objective cure rate of six months or more. Uh, Dr. Archie, can I ask you then, you talked earlier on about the discussions that were had uh, when um, the reclassification was made. Um, is there any sort of evidence where manufacturers involved in any of those discussions? With Sano? Or with Yes. Um, no. It was basically, um, Professor Moran was the chair of uh, Senate at that time, <coughs> and um, I believe the, the, the late Professor Moran, he was a, a general surgeon in Scotland, and, uh, but he was the chair, and um, he came to a, one of our meetings, and it was an informal meeting at NICE, and we just had a fairly brief discussion, which um, we, I hadn't seen the, that Senate review at that stage, and the discussion just, and we wrote a letter just saying, but we thought it was um, unusual so procedure to actually go from a C classification to an A classification, and that was it. It wasn't. So, if the if there had not been the reclassification, would then we have seen fewer of these operations done as they were a category C? Well, what yes, impact? The, really, what I'm trying yes. to str find out is what is the impact over that intervening period when of course NICE came in took over from Senate. But what do you think the impact would have been on um, the volume of work that was done? I, I think patients? it made a big difference because some colleagues did actually say, well, NICE have given this procedure an A classification or A grading. Um, and they said, expressions were used like, this shows that it's a safe and effective procedure, a safe procedure. And um, on that basis, it became a very popular operation. Um, the, and it has some advantages because it's a brief procedure. It can be done as a local anaesthetic and it can be done as a daycare procedure. So it was in many ways more attractive than the previous procedures. Yes. Whether it was more effective is, is debatable. Perhaps some people would say it is more effective, and I, I, but some say it isn't. And one of the big problems with this is, in general, when you introduce new procedures is what do the regulatory bodies do when they have a new procedure which is even might be more effective than the previous procedures and might have some advantage in terms of um, stay in hospital versus a procedure which may have more complications and especially those complications turn out to be much more life threatening, life changing I should say, um, than the complications of the previous procedure. And that's what tended to happen because um, the, the mesh procedures took over, if you like, from cold post suspensions, the first cold post suspension, which is a relatively long procedure and it has to be done under general anaesthetic, and also from vaginal yeah. anterior repair, which would certainly be less we, effective. We appreciate that. We've heard a lot of that from the patient groups, and they've told us uh, what they have been through yes. as a result of uh, some of these mesh operations. So um, there were not extensive discussions because um, between CERNIP and our uh, at NICE because um, CERNIP were an independent body and they'd made their decision mm. and we, we just thought it was um, mm. unusual to go from a C to A on, especially because the review actually talks about the, um, the evidence just being conference abstracts. You see because at NICE, um, NICE guidelines are produced on quite strict evidence-based levels and if the only evidence was conference abstracts that would be, have the lowest rating of all in terms of evidence. Mm. It, it probably even comes below expert opinion. Mm. But it's certainly, not, it's certainly not level one, two or three. Mm. I mean, do you is. think that the way some was structured in terms of it being voluntary impacted on the types of evidence it was prepared to look at and the weighting it placed on the evidence? So, so in terms of what being voluntary? Certainly, it was a voluntary... Oh yes, yes it was, yes. I mean, it, it didn't have a statutory underpinning, it didn't have the same sort of structure that NICE has, for example, when NICE looks and when NICE weights evidence. Yes. So was that part of the difference between the weighting of evidence or was it just simply... Yes, I think so. I mean, um, my, remembering back to that time in the late 90s, um, I used to give talks about, um, well, if you like, medical legal matters 
and I decided lost colleagues didn't had not heard of Cernip. They were a kind of well, they weren't they weren't a very high profile body. And of course, in those days, um, I don't think there was a website. So it was, I may be wrong, there may be a website in 1999, probably not. And um, NICE obviously were, had much better funding and produced the, the website and easy access. Everyone knew about NICE, but I don't think anyone, had, not many people actually knew about Cerner. Mm -hmm. But in terms of. And I think that made a difference because, yeah. but uh, word got out because um, there was, um, when the reclassification occurred, um, there was a lot of promotion of the operation by special societies and by colleagues and by manufacturers uh, who said this has got an A classification, it's safe and effective. So then it, it sort of took off. It was a, it was a very um, attractive procedure in many ways. But it was thought to be, as I say, a quick fix and a miracle cure. Right, well, thank you very much for that. Um, Simon, do you want to? Yes, Dr. Roger, can I, can I ask you something about um, an issue that's been raised with us by women themselves, women have been affected by much. Uh, many, many of them have talked about how when they present uh, with what they believe to be mesh complications, doctors are often very dismissive and will instead talk about other women's health issues as the, the cause of the pain of their, their feeling, for example, menopause. I'm just interested, given your clinical background, in, in firstly whether you recognise that that is a phenomenon, that dismissiveness and that, that sort of desire to link the pain to other, other issues. Um, and, and secondly, whether there's anything uh, that should and could be done to change that. How do, how do we make clinicians more willing to listen and to take appropriate action? Yes, I think that's, uh, that's been a big problem. Um, it's partly because there was, um, obviously in the early days there was a, a lack of knowledge about long-term complications, there wasn't much evidence. And so to be fair to clinicians, they didn't know what, what could happen. Um, however, um, it's probably generally felt that if you're putting polypropylene mesh into the body that there is a risk of that because that was the evidence from previous uses of polypropylene mesh for um, other procedures beforehand. Um, and there was no national register. And a few, some of the papers which were published in journals um, have been criticized for being, um, if you like, funded by <coughs> um, companies. Um, and they felt that maybe there was a bias towards not uh, talking quite so much about the complications. And I think, um, to be fair to um, consult gynecologists and surgeons, see the patient preoperatively, do the operation, and then probably have one follow-up appointment. And that may be after a few weeks, three, three weeks, six weeks, maybe three months, but then no more. And some of these um, complications, symptoms actually develop after that, even within a year, a few years later. And of course, uh, then they would go to their GP. And I think GPs were not well informed at all because um, it just wasn't known about quite so well. And perhaps the information should have got through to GPs. But not you good. actually said in, when you wrote to us, you thought there was a level of denial uh, in clinicians about the, the mesh issue. Can you? Well, I think, there was, um, I think there was um, a lot of denial. I, I think I put that in my report. Yes, so I did. felt that there was a, a culture of denial because I felt this was the the modern operation, it was very successful, it seemed to be effective, it worked uh, for many patients. Um, I think sometimes some of the success rates may have been slightly exaggerated because they were short-term success rates. Um, but I think there was denial because I think the patients found that when they went back to their surgeon or when they went to see their GP, that they, were, they felt they were fogged off um, and that the symptoms were caused by something else, like, oh, that doesn't happen. It's, uh, and I think one of the problems really was that when they were faced with this sort of denial, they then went on to another surgeon or another yes. oh, person. Yes. So yes. actually the follow-up was mm. very inconsistent and not very yes. rigorous. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it, it happens with other types of pelvic pain too, that patients do get shunted around because um, pelvic pain is quite a difficult thing to manage. I'm sure you've probably you've heard from the British Pain Society. Um, and it, it, it has been an emerging sort of subspecialty within pain medicine because it's very difficult to disentangle all different types of pelvic pain. 
And um, yes, uh, and if someone presented with um, some of the symptoms caused by or associated with mesh, I don't think that most um, doctors really knew what to do. And even now, it, we're, we're learning about the best ways to manage problems. Well, I was going to but the, I, I'm sure there was a lot of denial. They just think, oh, this couldn't possibly happen in my practice. And of course, um, with one of the and one of the problems I think is that maybe with the computer age that um, doctors can now talk about their success rates and they can put it in a public forum on a website, and um, obviously that makes it perhaps a, there's a little bit of bias towards saying, oh, my success rate is such and such because then I'll attract more patients, and, and that's been quite a big factor in the development of gynaecology in recent years. Do you think? Do you think over the years and uh, more recently, clinicians have become better at being able to identify the link between pelvic pain and mesh, and more willing to consider that link? Or, or are we looking at a consistent problem that hasn't improved? Oh yes, I think the situation has improved considerably in the last few years because there's now an awareness. <coughs> I mean, there's been information given to GPs, um, and so, and of course, there's things like the um, inquiry poster for GPs to actually ask patients to come forward um, and there have been various <coughs> campaigns in the newspapers and on television and in the media so I think women are quite well informed and with things like mums and the, in the campaign groups. They it's do. rather relied on those forces as opposed to the profession or its representatives? Yeah, the professional things have improved a lot. I mean the specialist societies acknowledge um, there were risks with mesh there's a, and the complications, um, unlike previous procedures, complications, if they do occur, can be much worse um, in terms of changing someone's life. And therefore, they, they are telling patients just now, a lot, lot of um, consent and information leaflets now do actually talk about the complications. And um, some are fairly guarded about what the complications might be. Some of them actually give much more information. but. Um, mm. There isn't very much, I mean, for instance, problems with um, walking. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any information that I've seen that says you may have problems with walking afterwards. But that does occur in a, in a small percentage of patients. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and problems with sex life and so on. No. It, it, so I think the, it, it, it's improved. And now, because the procedures are, they, even before this inquiry, the number of procedures being done was going down because it was realised that um, this procedure did have some risks mm. and um, even at that stage doctors were beginning to tell patients well this procedure we don't know really much, very much about the long-term outcomes and we do know some patients do have long-term outcomes which would be quite devastating. Which leads me to another point that you mentioned that phrase gold standard um, a few moments ago yeah. and we've heard women say that that's what they were told as well so it's clearly a common theme. What made the medical profession so confident that it was a gold standard? Um, because they thought it worked. Yeah. The procedure is effective in 60, 70 of patients, depending on who you read. So it was probably slightly better than the previous procedures, <coughs> like a giant anterior repair, um, and maybe about the same as a burst cold or suspension. But this procedure was, could be done, um, I mean, one colleague basically he could do a TVTO operation in seven minutes, which is very quick, but it's in one of the proposed and promotional literature. And so there was some advantage in actually doing more operations more quickly. Um, and, um, and as I say, it could be done, they kind of said it could be done as a day case. So they saw this as a wonderful procedure, which could... Wonderful for them, or wonderful for the woman? Well, probably wonderful for them. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, was, that there was a lot of um, promotion from the companies and from websites about this procedure, and, uh, and with individual quotes of, of success rates of 98, 99% in the early days, not now. And that was obviously not correct. And there was very little about the complications. And one of the problems with complications was um, some of the um, describing risks of procedures to people should be fairly consistent. 
you, you've either got to talk about the, the national picture or your own personal record. Um, and we're not very good at doing that. And uh, a lot of vague terms we use like, oh yes, the procedure doesn't have many problems. Um, but what you're supposed to do hugely is called the, the modified Kalman score, which is sort of one in ten, one in a hundred, one in a thousand, very common, common, uncommon stuff. And actually that's endorsed by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. They say that for, when you're counselling someone about a procedure, that's the scale you should always use. So you have some consistent. Um, because you could say, for instance, that um, the, <coughs> the a risk of uh, long-term complications, unpleasant complications, is about, if it's sort of one to two to three percent, that actually is um, common in the classification. Whereas terms we use like, this doesn't happen very much, or this is even rare, the classification rate is really one in 10,000, so, yes. Um, so the motivation was about convenience and speed, is that what you're saying as well? I think that had a big effect, yeah. yeah. And, and finance it, too. Yes, so it was attractive for NHS hospitals. And of course in the private sector it was attractive because you could do more procedures and patients would go home quickly. Um, and it was a well remunerated procedure um, for the time it took. So it became very popular with colleagues in independent practice. Um, and in some cases there was a tendency to maybe overemphasize the benefits of the procedure without, without talking about the disadvantages. Can I raise one other, one other point that, that, again, women have raised with us, and that's about translabial scans. Um, m many women have the view that translabial scans are both important in helping them understand the nature of the complication, uh, or even identifying that there is a problem, um, but also very difficult to access. Have you got a view on the usefulness and accessibility of translabial um, scans? I don't have a view on the usefulness because um, I wouldn't say I've got specialist knowledge in that field. Um, I understand from colleagues um, in uh, I understand from colleagues who are actually involved with measurement removal and also with the British Pain Society that it is a useful procedure. It does actually help with surgical planning to see where the mesh mesh has gone and what it looks like. Um, in terms of access, now I think the access is very poor. Why is it so poor? Why is it so poor? Um, mm, probably because there's so much pressure on the NHS to actually provide those services, but if they're going to be regional mesh removal centres, which there are some already, then obviously they should probably have um, um, labial scanning, because as I understand it actually does help with uh, the, uh, the management of the problems and also the um, surgical removal. Because the equipment involved is, it, as we understand it, it's an adaptation to an existing ultrasound machine. It's not, it's not a particularly difficult piece of kit. No, I don't think so. No, I think it's a, it's a fairly standard ultrasound machine, but a fairly standard probe. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's a lack of experience, mm -hmm. because if you go to um, most ultrasound departments, ask them if they can do a um, labial scan looking for mesh, they probably say, oh, I, I, I can't do that, I've never done that before. So there probably needs to be better training. But you'd expect that expertise to exist in the mesh removal centres or in the mesh yes, services centres yes. that exist currently and There is a uh, British Ultrasound Society and I, I don't actually, I must say, I'll, I'll look it up afterwards, I don't know what their views are. I'm not sure if they've published any guidelines about it, but they may well have done. Because the, it's the BMUS, the British Medical Ultrasound Society, BMUS, mm -hmm. and they may well have a view about the availability, usefulness and um, so on of the uh, scans. Thank you very much. Um, do you think doctors should be required to declare their interests on a register every year? Yes. I think in the modern world we are expected to declare our interests. Um, we do, if you're employed in the NHS, we do get a letter every year from HR actually asking us to declare any competing interests. It doesn't say what those interests are. Um, and that happens in the academic world when people have to declare their affiliations with um, bodies which provide finance for research and so on. And of course, in the academic world, you're required to make that public whenever you do a presentation, are you not? 
Yes, it's becoming increasingly so. Uh, when you go to professional lectures, some um, people do declare their most important interests, maybe not all of the ones which might be relevant to what they're talking So do you think there should be a register that the public can access of doctors' interests, which is updated on a yearly basis? <coughs> yes, ideally. I think it would um, increase public confidence in the medical profession and other healthcare professions. Thank you very much. Um, you talk about um, uh, recall of mesh. Can, can you explain what you mean by that and how it could be done? Um, I really mean, um, because what I said at the start, that I'm still unclear why there's a group of people who, they've obviously had complications, they feel they haven't been well served, and then there's another group, of, then there's group professionals who feel this is still a gold standard operation, and they would wish to carry on doing it, albeit with more pre-operative counselling and getting proper consent and so on. Um, and I don't think we really know what the figures are because I think when there are a lot of, one thing I would say, when there are a lot of campaign groups, um, obviously they're going to concentrate on the problems they've experienced. And uh, when you have articles like the Victoria Derbyshire and thing in the Daily Mail, it makes the public feel that there's, there's a huge problem. But it may not be quite as bad as they say. Conversely, there seem to be um, colleagues who think this is still a very, very good procedure. Oh, I've had no problems with it. So you still hear people say that. So what, what do you mean by a recall? Do you mean that every patient who's had mesh inserted should be contacted? Yes, I think it's important with mesh because the complications also seem to occur long term. Some of the problems with erosion and pelvic pain can happen five, ten years after the procedure has been done. So there are 100,000 patients over the last 20 years. There could be. Yeah. How do you find them? Well, I think you would do something you, similar to the... Because there isn't a register. Yeah, the, the MHRA um, hip recall. Yeah, but that's a register. There's, yes. There's the, there is a register, the National Joint uh, Register, yes, National register but there isn't for mesh. So how no, would you do well, it? Perhaps there should be. Sorry? Um, perhaps there should be a national ah, mesh register because, yes, um, and base it on the, the hip register because then patients have actually been informed about I understand that, but, yeah. but, uh, but so I don't yes. know how you can do it when there isn't a register. Yeah, so I mean, mesh has been um, obviously a very high profile problem. And in order to actually reassure people, I think uh, a recall similar to the MHRA and and national yes, but you can't do it if there isn't a register, is my point. No, no. I think it's a good idea, maybe, but, uh, but I don't know how to do it. Yes, well, I, I would agree that there should be a register. Yeah, yeah. And I think it should be retrospective because um, some of the patients may still be unaware that their symptoms may be caused by this problem, but maybe even some GPs, hospital colleagues yes, might not be. I'm not quite sure how you could do it retrospectively actually because I think you've got to do it at the moment it goes in. But, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, sorry. Can I just ask a question about the register? I mean we know that a number of registers are funded by the industry. Yes. Um, would you have a problem with that if that funding was open and transparent? <coughs> um, I, I wouldn't have a problem with it if it was um, if it appeared to be objective. Um, and not promotional. Um, I think um, some of the concerns about mesh, I mean, it, it does happen in other branches of medicine, is that some of the um, activity by the companies are in promotional, um, whereas a, a register is, should be truly objective. There would need to be independent scrutiny of the register um, because that's the way it is. So the issue is not about funding per se by industry, it's just the governance process no. around that. I mean, obviously, um, post-marketing surveillance uh, should, to some extent, be paid for by the company because it's in their interest to do post-marketing surveillance because if their product is good and it's successful, then they want to be able to demonstrate that fact. But then if it turns out to have certain problems, they do need to be truthful and objective and actually say what those problems are, whereas there's been a feeling in this particular problem that there's been a certain amount of a will cover up. Thank you. This isn't one of the problems with that, is that um, we've met women whose complications only became apparent five, six, seven years yes. after the operation was done. And I, I just sort of uh, 
I wonder how one can sort of catch up with some of that. Because if, you, if a woman has had it today, it probably looks, it may be very successful. But then in five, seven years, whatever, then we have problems emerging. So the market surveillance has to be very long term, really. And I don't believe that happens, does it? No. Um, I'm not sure what happens with HIPS. I mean, the, the National the HIP Registry, the MHRA, that's, I understand, is sort of lifelong follow up. Um, and patients will be called every <coughs> six months or a year according to um, their situation. Um, and I, that probably should happen with measures. There should be long term follow up, five or ten years. You see, it's um, one of the reasons because. Um, it, it's quite similar to hips in some ways because they start getting a bit loose after five or ten years and might start releasing metals into the body. But um, with um, urogenital procedures, um, as women get older, the tissues change, and uh, therefore the, the the mesh, which may have become quite hard, will erode through much sort of softer atrophic tissues. So intuitively, you can see there's a potential for quite late complications, and that does seem to be the case. Mm. Um, so in all the research that you've done, and it's been a very useful session, thank you very much, but in all the research you've done, are there certain um, meshes that you think are actually more successful in terms of not producing the difficulties meshes. that we've heard from women? The answer is, well, um, probably. Um, most of the mesh procedures, now, most of the mesh is made from polypropylene polymer. And um, that's been around for a long time. It's the same with proline, which is used for suturing, which has been used for many, many years. But it's because of the different uh, physicochemical uh, layouts of the mesh, because it's sort of crisscross and there are gaps in between. So it behaves a bit differently from proline sutures. I, mean, I know a lot of research is being done into biosynthetic meshes and into biological meshes. And uh, there are, there's a lot in the uh, chemical engineering literature and medical plastics industry about um, development of other types of mesh. So, yes, mesh may improve. I mean, I think one of the problems with the the polypropylene mesh, which proline mesh, which was used um, for most of these procedures, is that we don't actually know very much about the behaviour of it in the body. Um, there's a lot of research being done that's ongoing to see what the effects are in terms of, especially producing more distant symptoms like immunological reactions and so on because patients who presented with things like fibromyalgia symptoms have been told well, that's nothing to do with mesh, but it might be, we don't, we don't really know. So, uh, because mesh is, um, well, it's a synthetic polymer, I think more research should have been done into the effects of it in the human body. Because it does seem to... So it's quite, quite high risk to put something like that into the body without having yes. sufficient research. Yes. I think in retrospect, um, the, the scientific literature on mesh uh, on synthetic polymers does suggest that there is quite a high incidence of, uh, bond, of tissue reaction. Okay. So, and so I think more research should be done into the scientific background for mesh, but it is ongoing. People are still doing research in there. For instance, when mesh is being removed, it's being looked at to see what its physicochemical properties are to see what degradation has occurred. So explant analysis. Sorry? Are you saying there should be explant analysis done when you remove mesh? When the mesh is removed? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, probably when the mesh is removed, it should be um, analysed okay. um, just to see what its physicochemical properties are. So you don't know much about that, really. One of the things I was interested in earlier, you said that Obviously, the traditional surgeries, the culpa suspensions and things, they knew broadly what the risks were. So when women went preoperatively for counselling, there would have been a much better understanding of risk. Whereas with the mesh, I got the feeling you were saying that the preoperative counselling in terms of risk just wasn't adequate. So was there, was there a big difference between somebody saying, look, these are two options. These are the risks with the cold suspension. These are the risks with the mesh. <coughs> or were surgeons just saying, "Well, the risks are small on either." Um, 
I don't think there was a big difference in the preoperative counselling between the two procedures back in the 1990s when MESH came into being because um, the standard of preoperative counselling consent in those days was um, not what it is now. Yeah. And you know, um, I think you may have a copy, there's a 2003 document from NICE about consent for procedures where the risks and benefits are uncertain and that came in uh, and it was actually MESH that was partly responsible for that because having had the discussions with Cernium, NICE thought we, they would produce a document for patients um, so they would know that if the risk and benefits are uncertain they would have more information. Um, but I think generally if you go back to 1997 when MESH had its first Cernium reason that the, the doing of pre-optic counsel is nothing like it is now. Things have changed a lot in 20 years yeah. in terms of what people are told in verbal conversation, but then also the information they're given in terms of leaflets and also just looking everything up on the internet. So there's been a huge changing in clinical practice. Now, of course, doctors realise it's an essential part of their practice. There may have been a difference because the birch culprit suspension, if you like, was in established practice. Um, it did seem to be reasonably effective, but it was a long procedure, a long stay in hospital, um, and there were risks and complications which were known about. Um, with vaginal mesh came along, and if um, if we'd been more objective and actually realised this was a new product and given the same advice about well, we're not really sure about long-term complications, patients would have been better informed. But unfortunately, the focus was very much on saying, well, this is a quick fix. There's no problem. This works. So and so. Okay. I'm just going to ask members of um, the team here if there's a sort of final questions they'd like to okay. ask. Okay. Sarah, have that right? So, no? No. So, no. <laughs> All right. Um, can, I, so can I just show you a picture to finish off with? Yes. Um, it was really something. I'm very interested in um, obturator pain. And in the case of a TBT operation, um, Having been a gynaecologist, I just wanted to show you something which uh, had a big effect on me. And it's um, an anatomical picture of the obturator for women. It's one for each of us. The TVTO operation involves putting a fairly large, sharp needle through the obturator membrane um, behind the bone on the left of the picture which is the inferior pubic ramus. Now, some women are having problems with obturator pain, even to the degree they can't walk, because the, in the top right-hand corner of the obturator canal, that's where the nerve artery and vein go through. And it's fairly close to where the needle goes through. The needle goes through on the left side. But um, if you look at the fascial fibres, they generally go from right to left, left to right across. And so you think that some patients, when the needle's put in, they do get a hematoma, or they may have some neurovascular damage, um, or they, because of the lines of fascia, there may be some inflammation going along the fascial line. Now, of course, the needle's put in blind because you don't actually see where it's going. And even though the main nerves come out at the top right hand corner, they're probably very, very small nerve bundles which go all over the obturator membrane. And um, if um, someone suffers obturator problems, then they sometimes have problems walking because it affects the adductor muscles of the hip. You, know, you can't move your leg out quite so easily. Um, and obturator um, injuries and obturator problems are relatively common in um, footballers and ice skaters because they adapt their legs quite a lot. And uh, this is one of the problems, and I, having seen this, why I wanted to bring it up is to say, I don't think many colleagues are sort of aware of the anatomy of the obturator canal. Uh, and if you start putting large needles in through the things that there's a risk of infection and hematomas and so on. Right, thank sorry, you very I just much. want to show you that because mm -hmm. it, it I, I, had a big I wish you would me. teach me anatomy in greater detail. It's very yes. helpful. So, well, thank I know, you. Um, this is very um, cool. Dr. Baranowski at the British Pain Society is very this picture too because he said, yes, that's right. pretty close. Um, we're talking about a couple of centimetres, and obviously, bleeding and infection can track. 
and that, that would explain why the, the risk seems to occur. He is coming to speak to yeah. us, actually. Right, well, thank you so much for coming okay. today. Very grateful. It's been a really useful session. Yes. If, if there happens to be anything that you feel perhaps uh, you would like to have said differently or whatever, do let us know. We need to know within 24 hours. Okay. Because uh, we need to then put it on the okay. web so people can see. But um, certainly I haven't discovered anything and uh, okay. I don't suppose you have either. Yes, I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware you've received a large body of evidence and, and good evidence from people like the uh, CEPM in Oxford. Um, mm. So that was why my uh, submission was fairly short, really. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.